This is Local Edition. My name is Brad Pomerantz. You will not want to miss this half hour. We will be speaking with the mayor of Turlock. His name is Gary Soiseth. He is 30 years old, and that's young to be an elected mayor, but that is not his proudest accomplishment, I would think. <laughs> In his 20s, this young man traveled around the world to work in one of the most ravaged portions of the globe. He went to Afghanistan and he helped the Afghans try to build their country and bring it back. Over this half hour, we'll be speaking with Gary about his journey and his return, which saw his election to his native Turlock. I am so glad you're here. We're in Sacramento today. We'll be speaking with you for the half hour. Mm -hmm. Gary Soyseth, let's start from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Your family is Portuguese, mm -hmm. at least on one side, right. like many of those in the Central Valley. How did they get to Turlock? Well, it's uh, first of all, Turlock's a great town, so anyone that wants to go go to a great place and set of up course. shop, that, that Turlock should be of it. Of course, that's the mayor uh, speaking. Absolutely. So right. uh, my great-great-great-great-grandparents uh, excuse mm -hmm. me, came from the Azores, and they right. came over and settled. Um, and it was actually my grandfather who got into uh, almond farming. Right. And so he, uh, after World War II, came through to Turlock and found 20 acres and used his GI Bill to, uh, to buy this 20 acres of sweet potato farm at the time. And someone came alongside and said, hey, you should start this thing called almonds, put in right. the trees. Almonds, by the way, for those of us no, that yeah. speak a different form of English, it's almonds. Almonds, But absolutely. I'll try to remember to say almonds, but I'm kind of stuck on almonds, but That's continue. Right. You outsiders. Exactly. Uh, no, so he started uh, growing uh, almonds, and he right. was one of the first Blue Diamond cooperative oh, members. Oh, really? Absolutely. And so um, I actually, he's a third, I'm the third generation right. farmer, but I'm also the third generation part-time farmer. Uh, he was still oh, wow. working in canneries. He, he and my grandmother were still uh, killing turkeys locally. Oh, so kidding. they were working in the day in right. the canneries and coming home at night to, to grow almonds. And so it's something I'm very proud of. Let me ask you, though, why was it that so many Portuguese, mm -hmm. and specifically Portuguese from the Azores, mm -hmm. islands off of the mainland, mm -hmm. Why is it that they landed in the Central Valley? Was it one came and rode home and said, come, this is a great place? Absolutely. You see in the first generations of any immigrants that come to, to America, once you have a few that start in a section, whether it be uh, Irish over in New York right. or whether it be some of the Afghans in San Jose area, once one's there, right. uh, the rest follow. And so in, in uh, Portugal, a lot of them had an agriculture background sure. and the Mediterranean climate in Central Valley is right. perfect for Portuguese immigrants. So you were educated mm -hmm. in Sherlock. You went to high school in Turlock, Correct. but you were farming yourself as a Correct. kid. Correct. And in fact, when we spoke yesterday, you were farming. Was, yeah. And so tell us about how farming and ag kind of influenced you growing up. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think when you grow up looking at the discipline it takes mm -hmm. uh, to not only put food on the table by going and working in a cannery or working a second job uh, and then coming home and farming as well. Right. I think that discipline stays with you uh, throughout your, your time. Um, I was not the best farmer <laughs> until I was about 10 years old. So from 7 to 10, I was not the best okay. worker. Uh, but then once you get on that tractor for the first time, I think I was 13, and you start uh, helping out and being a productive member right. of your family, it sticks with you. And it stuck with you as you went to college. Correct. You went to Berkeley. Mm -hmm. What did you study at Berkeley? Uh, political science. Okay. Yeah. So that's the mayor side of right. you. Correct. But then you went to Georgetown for a master's. Is master's right? of public policy. Correct. And what was your focus? It was in agriculture and water resources. Okay. So, so yeah, please. Well, it's it's more the um, statistics and econ side of agriculture. What does a farm bill at the time I was there? Oh, yes. 2007 farm bills. Of course. Through. What do some of these subsidies uh, help or hurt? How do they help or hurt farmers? Uh, how is our trade policy, how is that helping or hurting our farmers? Uh, some of our pesticide regulations, that was one thing that I of studied. Of course. How does that help or hurt farmers? But why is it you go from poli mm -hmm. Cal to ag, deep study in ag at Georgetown? Mm -hmm. You know, Georgetown's known for great foreign mm -hmm. service and mm -hmm. it wound up, it all came together. Right. But, but what was it that made you really pursue this mm -hmm. to the nth degree? Yeah, so one of the reasons I went to Georgetown, specifically Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. is because I also wanted to work um, on, the, on the Hill. Okay. And I actually worked for the Association of California Water Agencies. Makes so sense. So again, focusing on water. Right. Uh, and it was there after one year that I realized I wanted to have an international bent to right. my degree. And that's when I went to India. And I actually studied agriculture and agribusiness marketing uh, in, in India for about six months. Okay, and but that's during your time at in Georgetown? Correct. Okay, so India, I'm sure, was an eye-opening experience. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about that trip. What were you doing mm -hmm. 
and what did you learn? Absolutely. Well, when you first, I was there at, at the Indian Institute of Management, which is mm. like a business school equivalent. Mm -hmm. um, and when I was there, I first got there and saw these big gutters, and I thought, what are all these gutters here for? They, they're massive. Well, about two months later, I found monsoon season comes through, and oh. those gutters are not big enough to deal with the rain that comes through. But I was in Gujarat, and it's a very industrial uh, town, a, a town of uh, two million people. It's a quaint little town. Okay, wow. And, uh, and, <laughs> and I for India, two million is a quaint town. Absolutely. Right. And, and I just uh, was really fascinated by how the Indian government was trying to uh, increase the middle class and how they were doing that uh, based on agriculture and how they were trying to feed their population. Um, I was also very interested in, as a Blue Diamond Cooperative sure. member, how to get some of our imports from America into other countries mm -hmm. and Southeast Asia, specifically India. And so, um, like I said, not to bleed back into Blue no, Diamond please. Diamonds, but they do a really good job of saying, you keep the supply up and we will keep increasing the demand. Mm -hmm. And so they really try and open up markets. Uh, maybe they've saturated North America and Western Europe. They're saying, let's try and increase our, our markets in Southeast Asia and Asia. But the international bug bit you hard. Absolutely. And so after you graduated, you got your master's, I mm -hmm. should say, from Georgetown. <laughs> what, what, like two, three months later, mm -hmm. you got on a plane and you went to Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Correct. In 2009, Afghanistan was so war-torn, mm -hmm. people were begging to get out of there, but you rushed to this nation. How did that happen? Well, if you back up, after seeing the abject poverty of India, I right. came back and um, was finishing my second degree at Georgetown, and, and that's when I was a White House intern for George ah, W. Bush. Okay. And he's wrapping up his presidency, and that's when General Petraeus came up with this counterinsurgency strategy, this right. idea of winning hearts and minds. And, and this idea of sending not only soldiers over to Afghanistan, but sending over doctors, right. lawyers, and farmers to help build up the civilian sector of Afghanistan. And so um, I've always wanted to serve in some way. Um, I'm the namesake of my uncle, my uncle Gary, who uh, passed away shortly after he came back from Vietnam. For, mm -hmm. um, and so I've always had that element of wanting to serve in, uh, with the skill set that I have, right. but also taking that discipline that had been instilled in me uh, watching my parents farm for the, so many years and just try and see what I can do for my country and perhaps another country. And, and so what you did is you could have taken the military path, mm -hmm. and I'll tell you, you ultimately did, but that's another conversation. <laughs> but you worked and you developed a position through the U.S. Department of Agriculture, mm -hmm. which is really a unique approach. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? Was it through this Hearts and Minds campaign? Mm -hmm. Correct. So um, what it was is um, the military came and went to all the civilian sectors in the United mm -hmm. States, U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture, Department of Justice, and said we need some mentors, some advisors to come over. And um, So I went to USDA headquarters, gave them a hard copy of my resume and said if you need someone that knows orchards, that knows agriculture, <laughs> uh, I'm your guy. And they said no, we don't have funding yet. Okay. <laughs> so they, they said no and then I got a phone call just a few, a few months later saying actually we do need you. Uh, I interviewed and was on a plane in October. What'd your parents say? <laughs> What'd your siblings say? What'd your aunts and uncles say? You know, to, to be honest, they, they were a little dumbfounded. Yeah. Um, and it's hard because you try and explain to them, um, even though I didn't grow up in the military, I didn't uh, go and right. enlist, they were grappling with the same issues and emotions of, of sending someone over to Afghanistan into a war zone. And as I understand it, one of your predecessors lost their lives, is Correct. that right? Yeah, T Tom Stefani, um, he was there in the um, 2006, 7, and 8, uh, that time frame, uh, early on when the program was in its infancy. Uh -huh. And unfortunately, a roadside bomb, um, he was in there with a Humvee, uh, and uh, he was killed once it went off. Because Did your parents traveling. know about this? No. I think uh, it's better they did. Absolutely not, yeah. When we come back, Mayor, I want to speak with you about your first tour mm -hmm. in Afghanistan with the Department of Agriculture. That was back in 2009. Eye-opening, inspiring, motivating, and so strong that you actually decided to go back. We'll talk about that when we come back. We are speaking with the mayor of Turlock. His name is Gary Soyseth. My name is Brad Pomerantz. We'll be right back on Local Edition. What is the size of the population of Afghanistan? 10, 20, 30, or 40 million? The population of Afghanistan is approximately 30 million people. It's Local Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. We're back with Gary Soyseth. He is the mayor of Turlock. Before his election, he went to Afghanistan. He went to Afghanistan for four years. The first two years, he was working with the Department of Agriculture. Uh, you just got your master's at Georgetown. You're young, you're bright-eyed, and you land in Wardak. Is Wardak. that what it's called? Correct. 
Talk to us about what happened when you got to Afghanistan and you went to the city, town, city? Correct. Correct. So you land in the embassy and you get dropped off by a helicopter to Wardak, Afghanistan. And I remember standing there with my Department of State boss at the time because okay. it was a diplomatic mission. And it was night and you just see mountains because it was a very mountainous uh, okay. uh, terrain. Is this north of the this northern is, section? Or? This is, uh, e it was technically east, but okay. it's just outside to the west of Kabul. Got so it. So it's up in the north, northern section. Okay. Uh, and I just asked him, I don't know what I signed up for. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what I'm supposed to be doing here. Give us a sense, those first few weeks, what you heard, what you saw, what you smelled, mm -hmm. what you touched. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Well, the, the, the sound is always the hum of a generator because there's no electricity other than okay. generators on these military bases. Um, and I think that the um, feeling or emotion that you feel is when you walk in as the new guy, um, especially being my age. I was sure, 24 sure. at the time. Wow. So just turned 25. Right. And you're dealing with uh, Afghan elders who had, have survived generations of, of war. The Soviet uh, Union. Constant, and, absolutely. And now... Uh, constant conflict. Yeah, with Al-Qaeda. And how, mm -hmm. and, and as they put it, this uh, pink-faced American right. kid was going to tell right. me how to, how to do agriculture better, grow things better. And so that uh, rejection feeling, that um, feeling overwhelmed feeling, uh, and just not knowing what to do, but just trying to, that, trying to channel that discipline right. that I talked to you about. What about the heat? Mm -hmm. Was it hot in October? Or does it start getting cold and then freezing? So, or how does that work? Absolutely. It, uh, in Wardak, actually, the summers are very temperate. It's mm -hmm. the winters that are the coldest winters I've ever experienced in my life because it's such high altitude. You're talking six, 7,000 feet oh, wow. in elevation. And so it was just extremely cold. Now. If I fast forward when Please. I went to Kandahar, that's when you're talking summers that are upwards of 125, 130 degrees. And that's part of that two-year mission. Correct. We'll get to Kandahar momentarily. So tell us more about what you were doing. What was the mission mm -hmm. in Wardak? Specifically in Wardak, I was working with uh, the Ministry of Agriculture, Irrigation, mm -hmm. and Livestock. It's the equivalent of our USDA, but okay. for a the Afghan government. And the idea was to build capacity, to treat them how to be a bureaucrat. Um, to treat them, and that sounds very negative. No, I know, but... But it's to say, instead of as an American, I'm going to give you this pencil to start up um, your uh, projects and to work with you, mm -hmm. or to get you the um, seed to help, you know, work with mm -hmm. your local farmers, you need to go through the process, through the line ministry, you know, village to provincial level to the central government to get those funds and move it back and forth. Do, do they have any tableau with which to take in this information? Mm -hmm. I mean... I, did they have a government, you know, even dating back to when the Soviet Union invaded? Was there anything to work with, any foundation? There was to a degree. Unfortunately, a lot of that government experience that they had was based off of patronage, was based off okay. of, um, honestly, corruption. Nepotism, corruption. Absolutely. Yeah, corruption. Things uh, that, they, um, that they wouldn't view as corruption, but we view and say right. you can't just hire these individuals. You can't just buy off these individuals. You need to do things and work with your local government and not isolate sections of the population because you're from a different tribe or you're from a different area. So it, it was trying to explain to them uh, what the government's role and function So would be. were they interested mm -hmm. in setting up these bureaucracies, which, as you suggested, in America is a dirty word, but in a growing, emerging democracy can really help set, plant the seeds, if I may, Absolutely. for a thriving government. They, they were. And the, the government officials I worked with in Wardak specifically, and then again in Argandab and Kandahar, mm -hmm. were some of the most uh, disciplined, devout, um, tough uh, individuals I've ever seen. Um, they've weathered, like I said, not only generations of war, but they also uh, weathered a lot of threats uh, directly from the shadow government. So the mm -hmm. Taliban and insurgents right. uh, set up a shadow government uh, to try and undermine the current government. When you say devout, mm -hmm. I think of faith mm -hmm. and I think of religion. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't have a real sense, I don't know that many of us have a real sense of how devout the Afghan people are. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're kind of on the outskirts mm -hmm. of the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And so is there a very strong uh, Islamic influence? Mm -hmm. Are there Christian influences coming down mm -hmm from the former Soviet Union? Mm -hmm. No, Islam is a central part of okay. the government and a central part of the culture there. Um, there's very few other uh, religions. Okay. And so, uh, yes, it, it's they're very devout in that regard, but I, like I said, I think that they're devout uh, and determined, really, and dogged okay. uh, to make sure that the government was up and running in the proper way. Um, these are these are men, and it was predominantly it was. men, uh -huh. uh, that, like I said, got night letters saying, do not work with Americans, do not work with anyone sure. else. Sure, so how did that work out? Uh, it worked out well. We lost a few government officials, and that's... Meaning to death? Correct. Oh, wow. So you, you work with 
individuals that come in and and brave the threats and and work right. with you. Um, Haji Baradad was one example. Um, he was a, a older gentleman, probably the oldest Afghan I've met. A lot of them die very prematurely because of death and malnutrition, or right, because uh, of malnutrition and and, uh, and war and disease. Mm -hmm. um, and he's a man that honestly would work with us and actually took a picture with me um, because he was very excited working with Americans. He was uh -huh. very honored uh, to do that. And so we worked well together. And then one day uh, he was traveling with his family outside of, of um, Kandahar City. He was going to one of his villages right. and was pulled over by insurgents and actually was shot and killed on the side of the road because of his involvement with us. But again, that's the devotion. That's that's the discipline right. and determination that I admire. Let's talk about your move to Kandahar. Correct. That was about a year in. Mm -hmm. Why did you move over to that, that well-known city? Yeah. So Wardak was a very rough place, um, but I, I was able to exact a lot of in, uh, um, positive changes. Mm. And so that was recognized. And so I was offered the position to go down to Argandab uh, District, which was one of the deadliest districts and the deadliest second deadliest province for American soldiers. In Kandahar. In Kandahar, correct. Uh -huh. It's just a district center, about 50,000 people. Um, and so I decided that Wardak was in a place that was stable enough that I was going to go down and try uh, to give what I can to mm. a region that's very unstable. Tell us more about your time there. So I flew down to Kandahar uh, City and then went out to Argandab, which is a district center. And How far? We, uh, it's just outside, just over a mountain range, Got it. Um, but it's a world away in, mm. in reality. Um, it's a place where when Kandahar City had a lot of insurgent attacks, they would go and they would hide in Argandab. And so mm. that's where you had those issues. But it's this, it was a deforested mountain range with mm. a very fertile valley where the Argandab River flowed through. Okay. You had Dala Dam and then a river, very similar to here in California. Right, right. And uh, so I lived and worked in the, in the district center, which was right next to a military base. So I uh, woke up at 7 in the morning and went to work with all the Afghans and sat there with the agriculture officials. And, and so there it was less about creating bureaucracy and more about kind of on the ground farming techniques. Absolutely. It, it was more about putting on trainings for local farmers, all about trying to make sure if a distribution was going to happen, whether it be for saplings or seedlings, mm. uh, uh, seeds, that it was doing it in a proper way and it was going through the Afghan channels. Uh, because any time that an American gave something away, um, that was a bad thing because it undermined the government. We wanted the government to be looked at as the person oh, to I go understand. to rather than the United States because we were going to be leaving eventually. Right. Okay, so tell us how you decided that maybe it's time to end my tour here in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. and when we come back, how you wound up coming back. Absolutely. But tell us what happened. So I was there for a year, and mm. uh, and it was a it was a rough year. Right. It was a year where um, you'd call missions, and and American personnel would get hurt because of that. Right. Um, you Haji Baradad, you lost uh, right. good men like him, uh, and so after two years total of being mm. in Afghanistan, I decided that uh, I had, had done enough. and so Two I years is good. Absolutely. I mean, no shame in returning Absolutely. home after two years, but the two-year visit extended. <laughs> you were home for weeks. What happened? Came home right before Christmas and then got a call from a general saying, uh, we like what USDA and other partners were doing. Uh, I'd like you to come in on our team, and I'd like you to be our director of economic growth, not just for Argandab, one village uh, or one district, but for the entire southern, Cal or southern uh, Kandahar region. So this is the Department of Defense. Correct. So now it's more of a military mission. Correct. What'd your parents say, man? I mean, come on. <laughs> what did they say? They said, yeah. enough, two years is enough, stay home, son? Abs absolutely. You know, and it's, it's during Christmas time. Exactly. You're these I mean, come on. Uh, it, it, it was rough, but they also knew uh, that discipline that they instilled in right. me early on that, that I felt uh, that tug to go back to Afghanistan to finish what I started. And that's what we'll talk about when we come back. We'll talk about working in economic development with the Department of Defense. We are speaking with the mayor of Turlock. His name is Gary Soyseth. My name is Brian Pomerantz. It's Local Edition. In terms of land mass, Afghanistan is closest in size to which American state? Alaska, California, New York, or Texas? Afghanistan is closest in size to the state of Texas. Texas is just 1.07 times as big as Afghanistan. Welcome back to Local Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz it's in Sacramento today, and we are joined by Gary Soyseth. He is the mayor of Turlock, but before he was mayor, 
He was in Afghanistan for four years, two with the Department of Agriculture and two with the Department of Defense. So you've returned to Afghanistan. You came home for a few weeks. You got called back. It's now 2012. Talk to us about what you were doing in your second tour. So the second tour was uh, came about because the general wanted to try and take what we did with USDA on the smaller level mm -hmm. and make it larger and say, mm -hmm. how can we get some of our projects uh, rocking and rolling? Sure, sure. Uh, one of them was, for example, instead of just working farmer to farmer on pomegranates, we're saying, how do we get the whole region's pomegranates to a juicing facility, for example? So that was one of the big projects. How do we get not only pomegranates, but apples from Wardak, uh, uh, grapes and other other fruits in and this is, area. Uh, are, now, are these fruits intended for domestic consumption, meaning mm -hmm. in Afghanistan, or were you working to create an export business? That's a, the the latter. So, right. a lot of these fruits, what happens? It was very simple supply and demand. We were mm -hmm. talking to these farmers and saying, uh, "You have all these pomegranates. They all come ripe at the same time right. or over the course of the same time." Then there's an influx in Kandahar City. What happens to the price? And it plummets, right? Of course. But what happens if you can take those second or third tier pomegranates, the ones that maybe split because of rain or, right. or damaged, and get them in, maybe it's you know pennies on the dollar, but get them up to a juicing facility yeah, right. and actually get some value out of them instead of using them for animal feed or some other things. So we were trying to create um, alternate markets, so for juicing. Uh, domestic Do they ha even have juicing facilities? They didn't until we started working with them. And so, so now they have juicing facilities? They do, they do. They have a juicing facility. I will say, though, it has a, a not a good ending. The juicing facility was up and running for about a year or two, um, and because of success, because it was actually getting some of these second and third tier pomegranates and grapes up to the juicy facility and was successful, it was targeted by insurgents and actually blown up. Oh, um, they were rebuilding it when I left, um, but that was a project that we worked on. And I know that it sounds terrible, but even though the infrastructure was blown up, the idea, the concept, the cooperation that the farmers had still lived on, and that's why they were able to rebuild the second time, because they proved that they could work together uh, in a successful way. So give us a sense of the difference mm -hmm. between working for AG and DOD. I mean, you just described mm -hmm. a military incident, which is yeah. devastating on so Absolutely. many levels. but. The military aspect was um, I was part of a stability division, and that name uh, rings true. Uh, we were trying to provide stability to the region and to the areas that uh, U.S. personnel were operating. So working with local farmers, not just to try and increase their economic mm -hmm. um, uh, prowess, sure. but also to make sure it's stable enough so that the Americans were looked at favorably right. and that it was an area that they could remain safe. Are we? It was working at the time, and um, I ended up leaving two years later. Mm. Um, I don't know if some of the success uh, that was short term that we mm -hmm. gained there uh, would be lasting, but I do think that, like I said, those concepts, those those ideas of cooperation and coming mm -hmm. together as associations, hopefully that has a lasting effect. Before we talk about your decision to run for mayor, mm -hmm. quickly after your return, could you give us maybe a moment, a, a, a kind of a slice in time when you were there over the four years that really has stuck with you? Mm -hmm. I think it was in Wardak, and mm -hmm. I was with uh, a platoon. I had been snowed in for a while, and mm -hmm. we were going out, um, and we were going out and patrolling and and, and looking through uh, the different villages to see what we could do for ag projects. Mm -hmm. And we actually went to a burned out uh, uh, AP3 station, so it's Which like is? a local police okay. um, uh, station uh, made up of locals. And we overnighted there, and it was the coldest night of my life. Mm -hmm. um, uh, sleeping bag was uh, subpar, mm -hmm. but. I ended up pulling guard with some of the soldiers. Which uh, means? Partly, basically every hour the soldiers would rotate on the roof to, to make sure mm -hmm. that we were safe as we were sleeping. Mm -hmm. And I felt that even though I was a civilian um, and I wasn't going to uh, be doing too much shooting, mm -hmm. uh, but I felt that I should pull that, that, those hours with them as well. So I'm up there and just listening to the stories of the U.S. military mm -hmm. personnel of uh, boys, really, 18-year-olds. That you were the senior. I was. At the ripe old age of 27, Absolutely. 28, you were the senior. I was, and listening to them talk about their backgrounds, living on the streets of Detroit, mm -hmm. uh, losing both parents, one to being an overdosed uh, uh, mother to one right. incarcerated father. Listening to this, and this, these are the men, because they were boys, they but they were men, men protecting mm -hmm. me and helping me uh, achieve the goals that I needed to achieve uh, was extremely humbling. Um, so I think that that one night listening to them kind of encapsulated how I felt about the U.S. military as if you weren't tired enough mm -hmm. from four years in Afghanistan. You came back, let me get these dates right, in August 2013, okay. and you decided it's time to run for mayor. <laughs> I mean, Mr. <laughs> Soyseth, come right. on. Weren't right. you tired? Wasn't it, have you did enough politics for four years? Right. You Foreign know, politics? 
It's true. Uh, yeah. Looking back, uh, I, I shake my head. Right, uh, right. But I came back from Afghanistan and I had this sense of um, wanting to do something that's bigger than myself right. uh, still. And coming off of Afghanistan after four, well, three years and ten months, I don't want to Fair enough. embellish. It's all good. Uh, coming after my time in Afghanistan, I figured I need to look at my own community and my own town mm -hmm. and see what I can do here. Mm -hmm. And and that bigger than yourself um, mm -hmm. mentality is what I carried through the campaign. Um, you're looking at third year of a drought, now it's fourth right, year. Right. You're looking at, um, we are 100% dependent on groundwater. That was a huge issue and a huge mm -hmm. uh, 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 talking point and, and promise that I made to the community. Did they use groundwater in Afghanistan or did they? I in, in Afghanistan, yes, it was a lot of wells, right. a lot of okay. contaminated wells. Uh, mm -hmm. They would use a lot of uh, river water, but mm -hmm. directly not treated. So mm -hmm. that's why a lot of them, mm -hmm. the life expense expectancy mm -hmm. was so low. Mm -hmm. um, but looking at Turlock, I realized that we were dealing with very similar issues, whether it be air pollution issues or whether it be economic development, not having enough mm -hmm. land set aside for econ economic development. Um, so I decided I'm going to put forward a, a bold or a vision, a bolder vision. Clearly. And, and, and it was clear vision, right. bold leadership. It was my tagline. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I just went door to door and explained, explained my heart, my passion for Turlock, where I wanted to take it. And to be honest, um, you know, seven, eight months into my term, we're accomplishing those goals. Tell us. So one, the last time I talked to you, right. we were talking about a water deal, trying to right. diversify that water uh, agreement or, or source. And I'm happy to say that uh, Modesto Sears and Turlock, after 30 years plus of negotiation, we've been able to get that water deal uh, done we, uh, about two months ago. So we are well on our way to diversifying our water sources. So tell now, us about the diversification. It's not just from groundwater, it's going to mm -hmm. be also from the Tuolumne River, which mm -hmm. would basically take water, treat it, and blend it with groundwater so we lessen our pumping. Um, and so I think that it's, it's, about, it's, it's an invaluable resource, um, something that will help us economically and also uh, become more stable. Now, while Afghanistan surely must have just sh shaken you to your mm -hmm. core, in some portions of the Central Valley, the subsidence is mm -hmm. so severe mm -hmm. that it can equally spook you. Absolutely. And I'm thinking about, I mean, I've been reading about subsidence mm -hmm. where the ground literally collapses on itself. Mm -hmm. You're at ground zero of subsidence Absolutely. central. Absolutely. It's, it's more prevalent uh, at this more southern part okay. of, of the valley. But I, I agree. Things like subsidence, things like uh, our socioeconomic issues uh, are, are off the charts. You're talking mm -hmm. about uh, whenever you see an unemployment rate of California, triple that for right. the Central Valley. When you see education rates, uh, you're looking at 17, 20 percent uh, education, higher education rates mm -hmm. in the Central Valley. Uh, these are things that are huge and, and don't just affect Turlock, but they affect Modesto and all the way down to Bakersfield, all the way up to right. Sacramento. Right. So, you know, when you see that around you, um, while it's not as dramatic as seeing some of the life and death situations in Afghanistan, it is to a degree very dramatic to me because I see in the eyes of the individuals as they knock on their doors the issues of making ends meet and trying to, to better themselves. In some ways though, is the politics of Afghanistan the same as the <laughs> politics of California? I mean, are we all just human beings yeah. and we all kind of come from the same place or yeah. is it really a cultural are there cultural differences? There are, but there's still the knockout, drag out fights. The uh, the things that you think of in mm -hmm. local politics in, in Central California are very similar to some right. of the issues you deal with in Afghanistan. Um, I think at the, the crux of it, I think that good people do rise up. I think mm -hmm. that politics, especially at the local level, have a bad, bad rap. I think that uh, you get people in Afghanistan trying to make their country a better place, willing to, to sacrifice mm -hmm. the safety of their family and of, of themselves. And while we don't have to make those sacrifices here in California, right. um, I think that you still see people um, rising to the occasion, and I think it's very inspiring. You are inspiring, I, I must say. I mean, the last five, seven years of your life have been truly inspirational, and I thank you for what you've done both for the people of Afghanistan as well as the people of Turlock. Mm -hmm. His name is Gary Soyseth. My name is Brad Pomerantz. This is Local Edition.